Hey everyone, about a month ago I uploaded a two-part series about Mothman, a cryptid that was seen in West Virginia. Point Pleasant is kind of a small town. Not much goes on there. And all they're really known for now is Mothman. And the Mothman story is pretty complicated. There's so many moving pieces. Again, it was the middle of the Cold War, so there's definitely the possibility of Russian influence in the story. Also, there's a military base in Ohio, about a two-hour drive from Point Pleasant, that was regularly doing test flights for spy planes and secret military technology. UFOs were a regular sighting in the area, and quite often people would describe different types of cryptids, aliens, special human beings, angels even, gremlins, ghosts, all sorts of different crap was showing up in the Point Pleasant area at the time. I really wish that I could sit down for like two hours and describe every single detail around the story because there's just so much going on around it that it's impossible to fit it into even a two-parter. And we are planning on eventually doing a long-form series where we pick apart every single detail in stories like this. But I'm gonna go over some of my favorite comments from the videos and hopefully by going over some of your concerns and comments, uh, it'll help flesh out the story a little bit better and help satiate my need to be as meticulous as possible. For example, Aiden asks, why is he called Mothman if everyone describes him as owl-like? Perfect question. And uh, they did try to call him the Mason County Bird Monster, and some people even referred to him as the Bird Man. But because of the popularity of comic books at the time, specifically Batman and Joker, the name Mothman stuck. It was kind of a, an outside influence of pop culture that sort of forced that name into it. Even the media originally was calling him the Mason County Bird Monster. But the outside influence in the story is kind of an important factor. Uh, Batman and Joker were so popular at the time, there's no way that it's a total coincidence that both Indrid Cold and Mothman popped up in West Virginia around the same time, and that they both so perfectly resemble the duo. And the question has to come up if this is an incident of pop culture superseding reality, if pop culture influenced reality, or if the United States military was using the similarities in pop culture to sort of discredit the entire idea. And I think that it might be a little bit of each column. I think Indrid Cold, for example, might have been a military psyop and that they made him look like the Joker or the Laughing Man because it would be such a recognizable symbol. People described him differently. Some people said that he had a blue trench coat that looked like it was made of a metallic material. Other people said that he was wearing black. But the fact that Point Pleasant has wholeheartedly adopted the Mothman identity into their zeitgeist is kind of baffling to me because in real time, when that bridge collapsed, the town completely stopped talking about Mothman. It wasn't a novelty anymore. Suddenly it wasn't fun to be in Point Pleasant anymore. It was a tragic thing. And then all of a sudden, one day, some government officials show up with the media and they force the town to take this statue in the town center. And, you know, bless them, the town ended up adopting it and loving it and they welcome people to their town as tourists, as people that are fascinated with the concept of Mothman and all the other cryptids that have been seen in that area. But the way that it was forced on them makes me a little bit uncomfortable because really Mothman represents death. It represents tragedy. And the statue doesn't look anything like the way people described it. It's the most demonic, horrifying, scary version of Mothman that exists. And if I was a citizen of Point Pleasant, I personally would be insulted by the entire concept. The way that the United States military was playing mind games with the town the entire time, lying to the town, hiding the fact that they had contaminated their land and river systems like 20 years earlier, just allowing them to drink that water and eat that wildlife completely unencumbered, unhindered. So it seems like a lot of it is just about skirting around responsibility and trying to make the whole concept of Mothman seem silly. And I think that it's because the military wanted so badly to make Mothman seem silly that I think that we should be taking the whole concept more seriously because something obviously was happening there. And you know, Occam's Razor says that it was just 
an owl. And I think that's what everybody would want to believe. That's the easiest thing to believe. But if that's the case, why, why, why was the men in black there? Why were they constantly harassing people about it? What was the military doing on that site that they didn't want people there after dark with weapons? That's so bizarre. I think that detail alone indicates that there probably was something going on in that site, at least after hours. Speaking of the men in black, Joel says, the men in black are certainly government agents of some kind, possibly Department of Defense. When I was a kid in the early 80s, I read a book about a series of UFO sightings. I don't remember where they occurred, but many people saw and reported these UFOs. This was pretty common in the 60s, actually. Even uh, the head of Project Blue Book said that you can't ignore uh, UFO sightings, especially when they're coming from dozens or hundreds of people over a short period of time in a small area. And when these reports are coming from ordinary people, respectable people in respectable positions. And he says the UFOs were reported by a lot of people, including police officers. Exactly. So the UFOs were often accompanied by unmarked black helicopters. And within an hour of the sightings, the men in black would show up telling witnesses, you saw nothing. Never speak of this again. And that's so typical of UFO sightings during the Cold War era. The UFOs that people were seeing were described as black arrowheads and giant black boomerangs. Several years later in 1989, the US military unveiled the F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter and the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber previously top secret experimental aircraft. I'm convinced these were the UFOs people were seeing in the book that I read as a kid. They fit the description perfectly. And I said the exact same thing in part two, that the Russians probably would have also had people floating around that area, asking questions, trying to figure out what kind of details they could suss out about the different kinds of aircraft that were floating in the skies. And this is actually something that still happens today. There are airplane spotting clubs, and th there's nothing nefarious about that. It's just, you know, cute little old men and women that like airplanes, and they just, they like to tell everybody on Facebook the, the neat little airplanes that they've seen, especially rare ones, or, or ones that they don't recognize. But a lot of these airplane spotting clubs are sponsored by, like, Russian consulates and stuff. So it's not like it's totally outside of the realm of possibility that this was just the Americans trying to cover up their own secret aircraft so that they could test these aircraft without the Russians finding out these kinds of details about them. And of course the men in black would have come along later to make damn sure that nobody was going to go around telling these Russian agents, like possibly John Keel. But what I find confusing about that is why they would pick a persona that's so uncanny, why they would drive 20 year old 30 year old cars, why they would be bald and wouldn't blink and would chew their food weird, things like that. They, the uncanny quality of them almost certainly would have encouraged people to describe these encounters with them. It almost had like a counterintuitive feature to them. But there was this very famous UFO researcher that ended up dying in an insane asylum. He had been driven insane by the United States military. They had buddied him up with an intelligence officer that was just constantly feeding him total lies. And with all these lies constantly spinning in his head, he totally lost grip of reality. I featured this man in one of my old UFO series, but he still trolls UFO conventions, spreading lies and making sure that only disinfo is ever discussed in these UFO communities. So that's still a thing that's happening today. The UFO community is not discouraged from existing because I think that the United States military realizes there's no way to stop people from talking about UFOs, but the discussion is almost always geared towards aliens. They want so badly for people to believe that it's aliens. As long as they don't believe it's the United States military, they're happy. So maybe that's why the men in black didn't wear 
uh, military uniforms because they didn't want people to immediately associate those sightings with the military. They didn't want to go around saying, oh, the military had some crazy new plane go by. It's easier to discredit people who say they saw aliens than it is to discredit somebody that, s that said that they saw a brand new stealth aircraft. Triangular shaped UFOs were so common in the 60s and 70s, and then all of a sudden people stopped seeing them. Right around the time the United States military unveiled their stealth bomber. So, not a coincidence. The Men in Black's job was to keep government secrets secret. If the Men in Black were in Point Pleasant silencing witnesses, then it stands to reason that the Mothman was some kind of secret military technology. Yes, or he was maybe even just somebody in a hazmat suit that was testing the land of the TNT plant to make sure that it was usable, or to test to see if it was usable again because they might have been playing with the idea of opening the munitions plant again. I only really gave you a taste of just how contaminated that land was. Yes, some of the infrastructure was left over from the old munitions plant and they probably could have rebuilt fairly easily with a low budget, but some of the facilities had apparently a knee-high carpet of asbestos dust lining the floor. So, uh, yeah, thank God they didn't reopen that plan. Sheep Lavender says, This is an easy one. Literally an aggressive and big owl. The behavior is very similar to an owl bird protecting its young or nest. Susan Wachowski says, Here's a little factoid. I didn't know about Chief Cornstalk till a second ago, but I looked and he was Shawnee. They believed in a bunch of natural wild creatures in and around their land. One of those being the Nenimki. Sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that. They are described to be as magical winged men and are said to speak backwards. They're said to have had red eyes. Sounds like they could be communicated with? might be worth looking into. I didn't want to go too deep into the native legends. I feel it, it's a little insensitive to start invoking those kinds of concepts, religious beliefs, because they're so deeply entrenched in their culture. I think it's disrespectful, especially considering there was already a huge stigma with Chief Cornstalk because he was killed on a peace mission by an American soldier. Supposedly, Chief Cornstalk did curse the Americans before his death, and some people believe that his curse gave birth to one of these flying winged creatures. When you look up the Mothman, people will often bring up Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds are a completely different thing, but there are interesting parallels. And one of those being that whenever a Thunderbird was seen, they would gather all the women and children of the village into one small area and all the men would surround them to protect them until the Thunderbird was gone. And it was shortly after they moved Cornstalk's grave to an uncontaminated site and then turned that land into a wildlife preserve that the Mothman sightings started to die down. I think that it's an interesting concept to say that this was something related to the natives' beliefs and possibly even was a result of Chief Cornstalk's curse. Obviously, I don't really believe in those kinds of things. But again, there's so many different possibilities about what could have been going on in Point Pleasant at the time that you can't dismiss everything. But speaking of Cornstalk, the statue that they used to represent him and the commanding officer of the Americans uh, in Point Pleasant at the time, the statues are made in the exact same fashion as the Mothman statue that's in downtown Point Pleasant. I really don't know what they're trying to tell us by tying in these designs with each other like this. Porter says, I'm from Point Pleasant and don't listen to the locals. They're either drunk, intoxicated, or both. And or just want more people to stay in town. So of course there is the possibility that it was a hallucination. I brought up the fact that LSD was being used by the CIA at the time to test entire towns ability to sort of function with small amounts of it being introduced into their food or water supply. And I did say that the water was contaminated. It's possible that it was just a byproduct of the toxins that they were already consuming from the TNT plant. Either way, it's blatantly obvious that the American military was lying to Point Pleasant was constantly feeding them bullcrap so that they were always misdirected 
in their thought processes about the Mothman. And the fact that the media took it on so quickly that they started spreading this story about a Birdman immediately upon its first sighting shows that there probably was outside influence from the American government to get ahead of it and start spreading lies about it so that people were thinking in the entirely wrong direction. Just like the UFO thing, the United States military, when hiding their secrets, would rather you believe it's a monster or an alien than know the truth. They don't mind if a bunch of crazy people go around thinking that E.T. is going to abduct them. But they don't want you thinking that the American military is doing that. They would rather you think that those flying discs you see in the sky are from another planet than ever consider that the American military has access to technology that we don't even understand. Again, they can't get us to shut up if we actually see something in the sky, but they can trick us into going down the entirely wrong thought path about something. And I think that that's what people like John Keel were doing in Point Pleasant, is ensuring that people were thinking in the entirely wrong direction about this issue. And it's the fact that the men in black were there trying to shut people up that makes me think that it probably wasn't just an owl. Though, I'm sure some of the sightings were an owl. It's like it was described in such a way so that somebody like me would assume it's an owl. But then somebody who has the propensity to believe in cryptids or UFOs would think that it was an alien or a monster. But none of the stories floating around the Mothman legacy have anything to do with military technology. Almost like it was their intention to make sure that that didn't happen. I am happy though that Mothman has been taken on as an identity from Point Pleasant, that they've sort of taken ownership of it and turned it into a pop culture phenomenon that attracts tourists. And I most certainly am going to go to that town one day, hopefully for the Mothman Festival, because uh, it looks like a lot of fun. I didn't get to go in 2020. <laughs> this really sucks, but uh, hopefully 2021, you know, the borders will be back open again and uh, I'll be able to meet some of you guys down there. I think that Point Pleasant taking ownership of the identity of Mothman is a good thing, a healing thing for them, as long as they also recognize that it was used to undermine them, and still is to this day. Another comment, should have mentioned how it didn't flap its wings. The claim, it takes off like a helicopter, is a reference to how it was taking off vertically. It would just vertically rise into the air, illogically, with its wings outstretched without needing to flap them. I noticed that too, that a lot of the accounts described it as not needing to flap its wings. They would say that its wings would extend or detract, but never flapping, ever. Just gliding, hovering, floating. But then people also said that it made a lot of noise when it took off, which makes me think jetpack rocket pack, something like that. So if it was some sort of a rocket pack device with laser goggle protection and wings, then it probably was some sort of a long distance rocket pack. I also played with the idea of it maybe even being a hologram, um, some sort of a projection that wasn't even there because so many people said that Mothman was accompanied with lights in the sky. The way that it didn't move naturally the way that it didn't even seem to leave any evidence. I wondered if it was even really physically there, or if it was just a trick that was being played on them, or, or like a distraction. But the more I looked into it, the more I started to think that it probably was physically there, um, especially with all the noise that people said that it made, and the fact that they felt like it was very real when it was in front of them. And it's easy to imagine that somebody through forced perspective late at night with their night vision, screwing with their ability to discern images and distance and stuff, um, that they could have thought that a bird standing on the hood of their car was actually a seven foot tall man. But so many people described it as a seven foot tall man that I just can't dismiss the idea. Maybe one or two people could think that an owl was a man, especially if it was mangy and uh, didn't have really good feather coverage on its body. But how could dozens of people describe it as a seven foot tall man? I can't get my head around that. And speaking of evidence, Maze Maker here says, 
Out of all of these situations, they didn't find a single feather? Nope. Uh, the only physical evidence that was left behind were footprints. And I believe that was at the second sighting, the Marcella Bennett sighting. The police only wrote down, they didn't take photos. This is pre-photos being a standard thing in investigations. Back in the 50s, 60s, and even early 70s, most reports only include text because it was considered at the time that a police officer's word was as good as a photograph. If a police officer describes something, then that means it had to have existed. So they described its footprints as being like two horseshoes put together. And I wondered if that was two horseshoes inverted from each other or two horseshoes that were lined up next to each other. And I'm thinking from the way that it's described, I think it was more like this. And that's not really the way a bird talon looks like. Maybe if it had like really screwed up feet, you know, that both feet had the exact same birth defect or something like that, that it would have had feet that sort of looked like this. But I'm betting that this is some sort of a stilt or a, a, a platform boot or something as part of a jetpack suit. Definitely not a wild animal. Definitely not a moth man or a bird man. Again, sounds more like technology, like a jumpsuit, just like Iron Man. You don't want to fall from the sky and land hard on the ground on your soft little legs. You want some sort of an exosuit or some sort of protection that separates the physical stress of, you know, landing and taking off so probably frequently. It sounded like that the concept of this jetpack suit would have been to land and take off. Almost like the suit itself was designed to spy on remote locations and then get out of there. The fact that nobody ever found a feather leads me to believe that this was not actually a bird. And if this was a classic armored skeptic video that I made like five years ago, the conclusion of the video almost certainly would have been to convince you that it was an owl. And yeah, that is the conclusion that I came to at the end of the two-parter is that Occam's razor says it was just an owl and then maybe everything that was going on around it was just coincidental circumstance and this owl sighting ended up getting mixed in with some of the UFO sightings and the men in black crap that was going on in the town at the time. And maybe they were just using the owl as a distraction. They wanted people to focus on this Birdman thing instead of whatever the hell was actually going on there. And certainly that seems to be an element of all of this. But the problem is that there are too many moving pieces around the story and there are too many corroborating eyewitness accounts. There's too many similar details and there are too many bizarre circumstances around it to just go full Occam's razor on this. As much as I want to just dismiss it and say that it was an owl so I can go on about my day without the stress of worrying that things like this can exist, that our governments <laughs> have technologies that they don't explain to us. It is a known fact that the US military is a minimum of 50 years ahead of us technologically. Even touch screens, this technology, you know, we were seeing it in movies in the 90s before people could buy touch screens, but that's because the military was using it in like the 70s and 80s. And even though the technology in the 40s wasn't quite as good as it is now, the United States military had access to high definition video. And they were using that for surveillance. You think they're gonna go around telling people that we're using these crappy little black and white TVs that were barely even like 120p? That they're going around with 720 or 1080p video? People wouldn't even understand what the hell they were looking at. There's, that's such a huge disconnect in technology. We can think like, yeah, rocket packs and jet packs existed back then. Maybe they had slapped wings on them to glide further, but the technology shouldn't have been that good back then. But the reality is we don't really know what the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was playing with. We don't know what kinds of different funny concepts they were coming up with. The Cold War was an arms race of technology. 
and spying, the ability to see each other and know what each other are thinking before they even think it. It was a war to know the other before they know you and to control the narratives, control your people and their people through manipulation, through lies. And I loved doing the Mothman videos because it was a great way to show how that exact same thing is happening right now. How the Western world and the Eastern world are warring for our minds, for our hearts, how they're propagandizing against us to get us to rally against some cause that's not even real, to undermine our loyalties to our own nations and to our own people, to drive us passionately against ourselves, not even realizing that we're doing it. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to my vlog channel here. And if you haven't seen my Mothman videos, go to my main channel. Watch the two-parter. And up next, I'm going to do a follow-up on ghosts. I want to tell you guys a little bit more about my personal experience of it, why it's the thing, the supernatural thing I believe the most, why I'm almost convinced that I've talked to ghosts before, really why I can't let go of the entire concept of spirituality. Even as an agnostic, um, there are just, there are just things that I can't let go of, things I can't dismiss. Can't wait to see you guys next time. Thank you for watching. You guys know the drill. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting Armored Media through Patreon and by buying our merch. The links are in the description.